As filmmakers, our voice is our value. It's the magical and tangible mark we leave on any project we touch. A combination of our tastes, our experiences, our circumstances, it reveals itself to us and to the world through our work, over time, project by project by project. I believe voice is found at the intersection of what you love, what other people love, what you have, what you don't have, what you want to do, and what you need to do. Right there, in the middle, at the intersection of all these things, this perfect compromise, that's where your unique voice as a filmmaker enters the world. Let's break it down. I obviously love movies. I love all the obvious ones you can easily guess, like Jurassic Park, Back to the Future, E.T., Who Framed Roger Rabbit. These are all brilliantly written and executed stories with amazing characters and captivating spectacle. They're also milestones in the history of visual effects, something you probably know I have an obsession with. They're also genre-bending movies. It's hard to peg any one of these into one specific genre. Jurassic Park, it's science fiction, it's action, it's horror. I grew up thinking Back to the Future was a science fiction adventure film, and uh, not a comedy, had no idea. It's a brilliant comedy. E.T. is a pretty standard coming-of-age film, just with an alien. You can see my admiration for these kinds of stories and the stories I choose to tell in my work. Uh, but then I think there's far more treasure to be found if we dig a little deeper into some of the stuff you may have loved as a kid. For me, I think of Mary Poppins, which as an adult I can now see had an early and powerful influence on my affinity for weird supporting characters and mixing mediums to tell stories. But anyone can point to what they loved as a kid and still avoid any shame or embarrassment. But what about the stuff you loved in middle school as a pimply teenager? The truly guilty pleasures, the stuff you'd probably actually want on a desert island as long as you were totally alone on that island and no one knew that they were the movies you picked. Growing up, my parents both worked in the Christian music industry. So there were piles and piles of free CDs in our house that my parents would bring home from work. Artists like Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman. My parents never put a mandate on me that I could only listen to Christian music. It just so happened that to be that it was what was there and what was free, so I was immersed in it. And it wasn't until sixth grade, right before DC Talk, Jesus Freak album and the arrival of Tooth & Nail Records, this is right before Christian music got temporarily cool, I was introduced to an album called Take Me To Your Leader by an Australian Christian band called Newsboys. This album was weird. It was playful. The album cover was spaceships, had spaceships all over it. The music video had the band in bright blue spacesuits. And the lyrics were about circus freaks and Captain Crunch. It made absolutely no sense to me. They were weird and subversive and loud and kind of scary looking and sounded like no other Christian thing I'd ever heard. And I loved them. One of the main architects of that album was its producer and the co-writer of most of its tracks, a guy named Steve Taylor who is a legend on his own right, in his own right, whose early albums were banned from Christian bookstores for their biting satire and criticism of the modern church. He was a tall, hilarious, weird dude, and I felt seen. Little did I know, this was preparing me for multiple projects I would grow up to work on with Steve, including music videos with 80s wizards and an acclaimed Kickstarter video featuring a cameo of me wearing the suit from Steve's album on the Fritz. I think it's imperative to embrace and own everything on our long list of influences, including and especially the deep cuts, the super specific ones that we might be too embarrassed to admit. It's what makes Tarantino Tarantino. It's what makes Stranger Things Stranger Things. Have the courage to stand on the table and declare your most uncool love for the most uncool thing. And you may discover that many other people have also been secretly loving that uncool thing all along. And you'll have just made it safe for them to be openly in love with it again. And you'll have an audience. At least a part of you thinks you know what others want to see. You look at Box Office Mojo, you read Twitter, you know what people are paying money for and talking about. So should this influence what you decide to make? No. But also, yes. The way I see it, you want to approach understanding audiences the way you would paint a wall. How do I paint a wall? You're not supposed to dip the brush in the paint can and just take it straight to the wall. You're supposed to wipe the brush on the rim of the paint can, expelling the globs of paint, and then take it to the wall with whatever's left in the bristles. Pay attention to what people are talking about, notice what they're paying money for, but don't write it down anywhere. Just wipe the brush on the rim and then paint with whatever sticks to the bristles. It'll help keep you relevant without sacrificing that special and potentially new and fresh thing, which is your voice. I made a web series once called The Time Closet. It was okay. Uh, people liked it, but they didn't love it. It was actually a feature, uh, but I was so embarrassed by how mediocre it ended up being, I cut it up into a web series and released it that way. Because nobody really expects much from those. Or at least they didn't back in 2007 when we made it. It was based on a short that we made of the same name, and that short was a lot of fun. It looked terrible because this was before children were born with cinema quality cameras in their pockets, but it was short, simple, and directly influenced by Back to the Future Part Two. We made this whole thing up as we went, and most notably, this was before I ever had access to After Effects or even Apple Motion. So all of our cloning effects were done using mostly old school in-camera tricks like masking cuts and whip pans and using body doubles. It was so much fun. 
So then we decided to try and make a feature based on this idea. We thought, okay, we've done the hard part. We know we can do these cool effects, so we don't have to worry about that part. That part's in the can. And the truth is, we didn't have to worry about it. And weirdly, because of that, we weren't inspired by it either. It was just work at that point. There was no spark or creativity or inspiration in it. That was when I learned a very important lesson, which is that failing at something new is almost always better than succeeding at something again. You can't have the only challenge on a film be the logistical challenge of making a film. That's a challenge that is always gonna be there. It's not an interesting problem, so it's not gonna yield very interesting solutions. You've gotta want more than just a film. You gotta want something at least a little bit risky and difficult and crazy. Most of the films we make at Red Giant are built around a product. Plot Device was created to showcase the powerful color correction tools of Magic Bullet Suite. Form 17 was written as a dialogue-heavy story captured across multiple cameras and audio sources, so we could show off Pluralize, which syncs audio and video sources in seconds with the click of a button. One year, we were tasked with making a short to showcase a product called Magic Bullet Film, a color correction tool that gives your footage the look of real-world film stocks. Right off the bat, Arne Rabinowitz and I saw a potential theme, old and new. We had a product that's core purpose was to take new footage and make it look like an old medium. That made us think of the cultural obsession with nostalgia and rustic design, how our pictures aren't really presentable until we make them look older and slightly crappier. That ultimately led us down the road to the story of Old New, arguably one of the best shorts we've made at Red Giant. Now, a few of our films existed as story ideas first and were then sort of retconned into product-centric videos. Interestingly though, those have by and large been our least successful films in terms of quality and execution and audience engagement. It's the ones that started with a product, an assignment, where we said, okay, what kind of story could we tell to show off power, the powers of this product? And then dug deeper to ask, what are the themes and ideas this product is built on? Those are the ones that wound up being our best films. So what are some assignments in your life right now that you may be discounting as distractions or irrelevant to your desire to make films? Could they be hiding opportunities to be something more? Something exciting? The first short I ever did for Red Giant was called Plot Device. This was back in 2011. Arne Rabinowitz, the marketing director at Red Giant, had seen some of the narrative work I was doing at my job at the time, making videos for youth and kids summer camps. Uh, I was using Red Giant tools in a lot of these videos, which when I put them on Vimeo, brought them to Arne via various Google alerts for Red Giant. He liked my work and wanted to work together. Now this was back in a time when you could put a short film on YouTube, have it go viral, and be directing a Thor movie two months later. I didn't get the Thor movie, uh, but I got an agent and a pile of Hollywood meetings when the short did in fact go viral, which was an insane lottery winning experience that I still don't fully understand, but I'm eternally grateful for. What's funny about Plot Device is that while it did quote unquote put me on the map, it wasn't exactly the most original or groundbreaking thing I'd ever made. But it was full of things that were unique to me. It starred my brother. We shot it in my parents' driveway. It centered around a leftover prop that we had originally purchased for one thing but didn't arrive in time for the shoot, so it, it sat on my producer's desk for two years reminding us of our failures. It featured many other props from past videos of mine. It was a hodgepodge of stuff, free stuff, we had available to us. And because we leaned into those things and embraced them as features instead of bugs, they elevated the final product and contributed to its uniqueness and voice. My favorite directors growing up were people who understood both their resources and their audience's perception of their resources and then exploited them. Directors like Robert Zemeckis, who saw technology as a jumping off point for interesting and crazy visuals and in turn, pushed those technologies to new places. It's not all that different from how we made movies as kids. We took stock of what we had available to us and we pushed those things to their creative limits. So like I had a camera when I was a kid that could do basic digital one-line titles. I figured out that if I could combine it with stop motion techniques, I could create some really crude animated text. I also had little brothers who would do whatever I told them to do. So I told them to pretend they were US Marshals and escape fugitives caught in a cat and mouse game amidst freak seismic events in my acclaimed 1997 epic, Earthquake 2. There was no Earthquake 1. I had a feature on my camera that would record only as long as I was holding the button down. So I could tap the button and record two frames at a time, leading to this epic stop motion car chase. I also had footage of Tommy Lee Jones acting in other films that I could seamlessly integrate into my own films. With every stage in your career, you will acquire access to more and more resources, and it's your responsibility as an artist to continue pushing them as far as they'll go. Let your resources inspire and focus you. Then challenge them and push them further. Guillermo del Toro once said, the natural state of a movie is not being made. See, anything can go wrong on a set. And it will. It will rain, props will break, actors will get sick, or get haircuts in the middle of production. How you respond to challenges can and will define your creative voice. The example that everyone loves to use is Jaws, right? Spielberg was 28 at the time, an age when most of us are at our perfectly peak mix of stupid and ambitious. Uh, he wanted to build a mechanical shark and put it in water, where we all know machines do their best work, 
Everyone in town said no, except Bob Maddy, who, will, who was best known for building the giant squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He was the only one who said, sure, let's try it. And they did, and it broke, famously. The shark broke, and the shoot was a disaster. And Spielberg's response defined not only the film, not only his voice, but an entire genre of film. He responded by giving us less shark and more dorsal fin, less shark and more barrels, less shark and more mystery. Spielberg, in all his young stupidity, created a massively interesting problem and responded to it with a massively interesting solution. How you respond to challenges can define your voice as a storyteller.